Thank you very much. 40th Secretary of Commerce makes you sort of adds a certain amount to it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we were going to discuss two big things which have massive interest to everyone here. The first, and both within your brief, um, come back to US competitiveness generally in a bit. But I thought we might begin with trade. And you've been on a lightning tour, um, jet lag tour of, of Asia with Malaysia next. And you said in Japan that you wanted to form an economic framework that would be even better than CPPTP, um, or the Comprehensive <laughs> and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. And you said it could be even more robust in some ways than the traditional free trade agreement. And this is this Indo-Pacific framework which America has been talking about. And I think many of the business people here would say, look, we would rather have a trade pact. That's what we want. And I know that's difficult politically, but maybe you could spell out exactly what this means and why it is better. Yeah. So thank you. It's good to be with you, and hello to everybody. I think that, uh, look, I understand that. You know, I began my week in Tokyo. I'm here now. I'll be heading off to Malaysia. I'm meeting also while I'm here with uh, my counterparts from New Zealand and Australia. And we hear that, we hear that, you know, CPTPP, we want America in. Here's what I would say. Um, for various reasons, you know, that is not going to happen now. But, the, but President Biden is crystal clear. When he says America is back, he means back with our allies and back in this region. So since he's been in office, the vice president has been in Vietnam, Secretary of Defense has been here, I am here, USTR Thai is here. We are very serious in re-engaging economically with the Indo-Pacific. And when we talk about the topics, it is broader in some ways and a little bit less restrained or constrained than a traditional free trade agreement. For example, we can talk about partnerships around the supply chain specific partnerships around working together to make sure that we and our allies in the region have a redundant and secure supply chain. You know, Australia has critical minerals that we all need. We can talk specifically and somewhat more flexibly about partnerships. Um, interoperability, uh, which is critical to facilitate digital trade. Tech standards. You know, we were talking backstage yeah. about artificial intelligence. You know, you wouldn't see setting tech standards in a traditional free trade agreement, but it is vital. Who's going to write the rules of the road for emerging technology? We want to write the rules of the road with our like-minded allies in this region. Semiconductors. You know, so I think that um, uh, decarbonization and should, green... Should we, should we see this as sort of the trade equivalent of what people talked about at one time of a kind of coalition of democracies. This is America and its allies in Asia getting together in, a, in an economic way which does not involve a specific trade pact, but which involves a series of kind of complicated alliances building up to that. I think that's exactly, that's, that is well said. And you, you know- can, You can hire me if you want. I <laughs> I pro I'm sure I could not afford you. Um, <laughs> But uh, I think that is well said. And you know, we, I'm here in the region beginning the discussions, laying the groundwork. Uh, we're likely to launch a, you know, a more formal um, process in the beginning of next year, which will culminate in a proper economic framework in the region. And Does that mean an actual agreement? Yeah, that would be a exactly, exactly. Do you, do you accept though that part of the cost of this is, as you know, China and for that matter Taiwan are both applied to join the CPTPP, that that could be a consequence of it, that China becomes part of the trade agreement that America left under Donald Trump. Yeah. So I will say this. China is going to do what China is going to do. And whether or not the, the current members of CPTPP allow China to come in, that will be as it will be. What I'm talking about is, is, is about working with our allies in the region, allies we've had for decades in an incredibly important and fast-growing region. You know, in the Indo-Pacific, 940 million people are entering the middle class in the next seven to 10 years. You know, it's 4.6 billion people some, here in Singapore, some of the best innovation and in technology in the world. So, this isn't 
about China. This is about developing robust commercial and economic relationships with, with our partners in the Indo-Pacific, where we have had a robust relationship for a long time, but for the past few years. I mean, the elephant in the room, the reality is, America has been absent. We have been absent from the region, largely absent in the past few years. And when I am here in the region, there seems to be a strong pull to have us back. And so we want to work towards this agreement. One last thing on that. I mean, watching or listening to um, Wang Shishan talking earlier, it was interesting to me how many times he mentioned the word multilateral, multilateral, multilateral. Does it, does it sort of worry at all that China might be seen as taking up the banner of multilateralism whilst America is seen in this more a la carte way? So again, I think that we just have, to, as I often say, is we, we have to kind of run faster in America and play our game in America. We, we have our strategy. We are, America is a fantastic and benign and collaborative ally and partner. We have some of the best entrepreneurs, the deepest capital markets in the world, and a long history of working in this region. So we're going to do what we know how to do, and you know, China will do what it's going to do. You mentioned uh, international standards, and again, just talking to Henry Kissinger earlier, the, the all-important issue of artificial intelligence, which also goes into your brief on competitiveness. You know, this is the industry of the future. Who is going to write the rules of artificial intelligence, and what, yeah. what do you see as America's ro role in that? So I think this is an enormously important topic. Um, if you think about the internet, which of course was incredibly you know, powerful, transformative, disruptive, it primarily affected advertising in the advertising market uh, and e-commerce, you know, retail. relatively small pieces of our economy. Now you look at AI. AI will change fundamentally logistics, biotechnology, healthcare, every single aspect of our economy. So I think that it's really impossible to overestimate the, you know, what is coming in terms of disruption, transformation, change, and progress with respect to AI. Which means, first of all, we have to get it right in how we regulate. But secondly, we absolutely have to make sure that like-minded partners who share values around anti-discrimination, privacy, human rights, um, are, to, are together writing the rules of the road. So for example, that's, what I, that's part of what I'm talking about. When I sit down with Malaysia, when I sit down with Singapore, I had a great discussion yesterday with the tech minister in Singapore on exactly this topic, which is we, ha we share the same values. So we should be writing the rules of the road. We should be setting forth the tech standards and governance models for the appropriate and safe use of AI. But are there particular bits within that? Is there particular sort of mini battlefields within that yeah. trying to set standards in AI that you really want to focus on? So I would say this. Um, I think this has to be very use case specific. So AI as applied to biotechnology will be different from AI as applied to logistics. Um, and certainly, there can be no room for the use of AI um, for you know, surveillance or um, uh, anything that pervades discrimination or that kind of get, you know, gets into ethical questions. So it's, it's an enormously complex. I think the trick, the trick is use case specific, industry specific, flexibility. But this is, a, this is an emerging field. We are in the, I don't know a ton about sports, so I should be careful, but you know, like second or third inning of AI. So we have to regulate and be, be careful for the dangers, but the potential is enormous, so we have to have some flexibility and sensible regulations that we develop in partnership with industry and stakeholders and al like-minded allies. 
just I mean, that leads a bit into the idea of American competitiveness. And I suppose, again, many of the business people here would, would, would look at what's happening in America and they would see that there's been a renewed focus, and you've been at the front of it, in terms of sort of focusing on industries, focusing on different um, parts of the American economy to push forward. But they would also say, look, a lot of Biden's bills also involve things like giving jobs to Americans, unions, all those things, which is precisely what goes down badly in the rest of the world. Um, is there an element that America first harms America's attempts to br help the other side of your brief, the trade brief? Yeah. So like everything, it's a balance. You know, President Biden is, as you say, extremely focused on creating good quality jobs in America uh, and good, good and emphasis on quality, right? Decent pay, decent benefits, decent working conditions. Having said that, we are equally focused on um, kind of re-strengthening our relationships with our allies uh, in, in Europe, uh, in the Indo-Pacific, and around the world. And I think that, you know, we talk about onshoring, but we're also talking about uh, friend-shoring. And it, it isn't realistic. Take semiconductors. It is a global, complex supply chain. I'll be going to Malaysia tomorrow visiting advanced manufacturing facilities and semiconductor facilities. That won't change. Mm. Right, and that is, you know, that is that is okay. That is a good thing. We don't think that everything can be domestically produced, so we want to work with our allies and 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 friend shore. But yes, of course, we also want to enhance domestic supply of uh, semiconductor chips. Do you think? Do you think the nature of the debate about competitiveness has changed, partly because of what's happening with China, but also partly because of COVID? It has made countries think, countries that used to espouse what might be broadly described as kind of free market principles, it's made them think much harder about what industries they need to keep at home. Yeah, it, absolutely, absolutely. You know, semiconductors is the best example. Mm. Um, there's a global shortage of semiconductors. I was at a, a CEO roundtable earlier of a variety of different companies, and they were all saying, we can't get our hands on enough chips. So there's a, you know, global demand is vastly outstrip global supply. In the United, the United States effectively, you know, invented or the, the semiconductor industry was born in the U.S. And we, in search of cheap labor overseas, we've watched that dwindle. We now make, you know, zero percent of the world's most sophisticated chips in America. We only make... Uh, 12 or 13 percent of global supply. A couple decades ago, we made 40 percent. So we absolutely need to increase domestic supply. Uh, by the way, not necessarily just by American companies. You know, like we have, there are companies in Japan and Korea and Taiwan, which, uh, which we hope will set up shop in America and have domestic production. But at the same time, we do need to collaborate even in a tighter way with our allies. I mean, it, these global supply chains are, by their nature, global. Um, and we have to shore up those partnerships. And it, it's, about, it's about the supplies as well, like critical minerals, minerals for batteries, you know, minerals for semiconductors. So it's, you know, complex. You can imagine somebody, though, from an American perspective, saying, look at, you know, the, the, the Biden administration has come in talking about the need to build a bigger technology um, industry, but you're also the people who are pushing antitrust policy, which I know is not yours, towards the big tech giants. You see a lot of people here from, from, from big banks and so on. You look at Wall Street, it's another massive area of American competitive strength. And yet there's definitely some desire to rein in Wall Street in the, in the, in the Biden administration. How do you sort of, from, from somebody who's trying to sell US competitiveness, but also bring the Democratic Party with you, how do yeah. you do that? I think it is really quite consistent, which is to say we're pro-competition. Competition has what, is what has formed the basis of such a successful, innovative, and vibrant economy. And so, whether it's big tech or any other, you know, big company, if they, if, if there are anti-competitive um, factors at play, 
that hurts competition, that hurts startups, that, that snuffs out innovation. Um, the American capital markets are, as you say, robust and liquid, uh, and that, that is a good thing, right? America is still um, the best place to start a business. You, you don't see a kind of contradiction between, I suppose, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party and your job to the extent that there is, I suppose, considerable <laughs> anger with capitalism and various sorts yeah. of it on one part of the Democratic Party, and you, on the other hand, are trying to boost American business. I would say this. Um, it is true. Uh, I am, and President Biden is, you know, uh, self-proclaimed capitalist and self-proclaimed pro-business. We want to have policies which encourage innovation and business growth, and, and that is important. Having said that, look, the excesses of capitalism are on full display in America. They have led to a lack of competition, a, a concentration of wealth at the top, which is threatening to our democracy and to capitalism itself. So I don't, I don't actually see the tension. I think, I actually think we cannot continue to have a vibrant democracy or entrepreneurial scene with this concentration of power or wealth. And so I think it's healthy, actually. I think you can be both. You know, I think you can be both. But you, we have to move towards a more inclusive, equal um, form of capitalism where businesses are successful, but workers are also successful. You talked about the excess of capitalism. And one very obvious area is the environment. You know, we had COP last week. Do you see that as America setting off on a new in, on, in a new way when it comes to, to the environment. You heard Mike earlier talk about the necessity of getting rid of coal and things like that. Is that part of your vision? Is your, how green is your vision of American, <laughs> the, the newly competitive America you're, you're building? I'd say to be? very green, totally green. Uh, and in that regard, huge opportunities for job creation for innovation and for collaboration with our partners in, in the Indo-Pacific. So look, the reality is we will not be able to achieve the goals that we all want to and need to as it relates to decarbonization without more innovation. Hmm. Like scientists will tell you 25% of the goal will be achieved um, by technology that, is, that doesn't exist. So that means you know, venture capital, entrepreneurs, innovation, research and development, bigger investments in research and development um, are critical. You know, we just, the president just signed the trillion dollar infrastructure package. In that package is the biggest climate investment ever in the history of the United States. Huge investments for electric vehicle charging stations, tax incentives to innovate. So uh, I think, and there's a lot of innovation going on in this region. So I think very green, but I think if we do it right, it will, it will create millions of jobs. And the challenge is that we have to bring everybody along. I mean, the reality is if you're in a coal-affected community, when you hear climate change, you get nervous, you hear I'm losing my job. So it's on us to have a just transition and make sure that everybody's included. Putting on, you used to be a governor, famously, <laughs> but putting on that hat, how difficult is it to sell greenery on the doorstep? Yeah. It can be difficult, and I don't think we, I think we should be real about the challenges. Mm -hmm. It is necessary, and we have to move forward aggressively and, and, you know, as robustly as possible. But if you live in West Virginia or Kentucky or Ohio, Pennsylvania, and it is the only way you and your, and you're a third or fourth or fifth generation coal family, it can be difficult. And I think that we have to, those, concerns are valid. You know, I was the governor of Rhode Island, not a coal community, but a manufacturing community. And when I talked about tech, that made people a little nervous. They wanted old line manufacturing. And so I think if we will be successful in bringing people along, you have to be real about the challenge, but also meet the needs. You know, provide jobs, provide new jobs, provide job training. One last thing is that, you know, you, as you said, you were a governor, now you've entered this horrific world of cabinets and things where you're a part of it. What, what's the biggest change in that? I mean, you were always seen as one of the great pragmatists of the Democratic Party. 
Yeah. Once it actually comes to working in an administration, how different is that? You know, I'd like to think I still am a great pragmatist. A couple of weeks ago, I was able to resolve the 232 steel and yes. aluminum tariffs with the, with the Europeans. Um, I'm here, you know, practically looking to kind of make deals and, and make things happen on the supply chain issues. I'm in the middle talking to businesses. So I'm so far finding it to be a place in this administration, and the president encourages this, get things done, you know. I'm not one for the high-minded jargon, like let's get things done, and uh, so far I've been able to find my spots to do that. With slightly more jet lag. Um, so, uh, quite a bit more jet lag. Secretary Raimondo, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.